so thank you all so much good evening and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us i'm zoe toon i'm marketing coordinator at low carbon hub and uh, you're joining us for the third webinar in our 2021 community energy series and um, for those of you that don't know joining us for the first time um, the low carbon hub is an environmental social enterprise that's uh, out to prove we can meet our energy needs in a way that's good for people and good for the planet and um, as I mentioned we've um, run previous webinars and webinar series both last year and earlier in this one and all of those are available on our YouTube channel so if you've missed any of those want to catch up with any of the news or info about our programs and projects I can highly recommend our previous guests we've had some really great guests on um, on our webinars and so they're all available on our YouTube channel I can post a link in the chat a bit later and um, just a reminder that this one will also be recorded and will go up on our YouTube channel a bit later on. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to have our presentation um, first um, uh, from Adriano. Barbara is going to help out answering some questions in the chat. And um, I'm also going to help with, um, with some of the questions. And then we'll also have time for questions at the end, Adriana will be able to respond to any. So do pop them in the chat if you have them throughout and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Um, there's a lot of you here, so yeah, we'll, um, we'll crack on. So um, this week we have our very own Innovation Director, Adriano, joining us to give us a presentation on innovation at the Low Carbon Hub, Life on the Grid Edge. And he's gonna explain to us all what that means and uh, what that means for our energy system. So Adriano, over to you. Thank you, Zoe. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy it. So first of all, uh, I will do my best to keep the presentation itself very short. Um, so you all have plenty of time to ask uh, the questions you feel um, you would like to be at least tried to be answered. Um, the, I, what I will try to do is, um, as we are talking about grid edge, is to give a flavor, uh, particularly for those that might not be familiar, of how the current electricity system works um, and, um, and bring it, kind of the, try to bring the outcomes of the work that we are doing on the grid edge, which is about optimizing uh, our existing infrastructure um, but also trying to show how by turning the system on its head, we can uh, benefit us all. Um, then I will go into some of the practical trials that are taking place. And um, hopefully by the end, we'll be able to have uh, a discussion uh, about um, the role of local power uh, in making a zero carbon energy system work for all. Um, so to start with, if we are talking about the grid edge, uh, what does it mean? And um, where does our power come from? And, uh, and how does it get to us? So if uh, if we look at the, the majority of the energy and how it's been um, for quite a long time, we have this centralized system where the vast majority of the energy that is used is generated in these great big power plants um, that uh, eventually are connected to the transmission network and the role of the transmission network is to provide that um, large scale interconnected um, national infrastructure that is bringing power from all these large power stations and uh, distributing it over, all over the country. Um, but, you know, we can't really get our energy directly from the transmission network. So the next stage is how does it start getting close to us. So if we look at Oxfordshire, uh, in Oxfordshire, I'm not quite sure if it's four or five, we have what is called these bulk supply points. Uh, it is where the, the transmission network gets 
into what is referred to as the distribution network, which in the case of Oxfordshire, most of it is operated by FSEN. Um, and um, there are some parts towards um, Chipping Norton and Bunbury, which is operated by WPD. But anyway, uh, the idea is that you have these great big bulk supply points coming from the transmission network. They bring the energy to the transmission network. And from there, we start branching out, um, going into primary substations. Those primary substations, then they, they let go um, what is called as feeders. And uh, the feeders coming out of the primary substations, they then have the lots of transformers connected to them. And these transformers uh, are the ones we see around when uh, around the streets uh, or in maybe rural parts, you might see them uh, mounted on poles. Um, from, oops, wrong way. So from those um, cables that we come out of the feeders, we then get the cables that come into our houses. And um, the cables that, as they come into our house, they are given a specific name, which is a point of connection. Every point of connection ha will have a meter, and this meter is, has a unique reference. So we all have the pleasure of having an electricity bill. And um, finally, electricity has arrived at uh, our house, at um, you know, the fuse board. Now, quite a lot of, uh, in many places, um, it is referred to as the grid edge, uh, that point where the um, electricity network gets to a meter. Um, there are many people that see it very differently. Uh, meters don't use energy. Meters are just the means for uh, measuring it. So it is quite common and it is an approach that we definitely take in the low carbon hub that the grid edge is where energy is used. Uh, so energy is used by people, energy is not used by meters. Um, and also um, more and more energy is also generated at the very edge of the grid at, at those uh, small branches coming out of the electricity network. Um, so what is the edge? The edge is where energy is used, it's increasingly generated, and uh, I kind of insist on this. Energy is used by people for a purpose. Uh, energy is used within a context. It is not just volts, ampères, power, or, or bills. It is about what people use energy for. Therefore, the context within which it is used is as important as the energy itself. Um, so if we want to get a slightly more technical, uh, the national grid, the transmission network, is these, the great big pylons, they uh, run extra high voltage, 400 uh, kilovolts. As they come into the bulk supply points, it dropped to 132 kilovolts kV. From there, it goes into the primary substations at uh, three, 33 kV. From there, it drops to 11 kV for each feeder. Um, for every transformer coming out of that feeder, you have three phases that um, run at 440 volts. And then as it comes into our house, we receive it for most of us at uh, 240 volts. Now, some of um, the users will be connected uh, at 11 kV. 
Some of them will be connected at 33 kV. Usually these are the very big ones. But the vast majority of uh, energy users like us are connected at uh, the low voltage part of the network. It's that part of the network at 440 volts or 240 volts. So the, the great majority of the energy we use are at these LV, the low voltage part of the network. So to a great extent, um, it might be interchangeable that when we are referring to as the grid edge, we might be talking particularly about the low voltage part of the network. Um, so what does that mean in terms of uh, innovation and, um, and also in making a system that is fair for all? The first thing to bear in mind is this is to do with physics, how the system works, that um, in order to keep the lights on, um, supply and demand of energy must be kept in balance all the time. And uh, the way our current system works, uh, this is coordinated uh, by the ESO, the Electricity System Operator, the National Grid, and it is a top-down process. So the National Grid is watching what is happening in the entire network in terms of supply and demand. If demand is getting bigger than supply, they will be telling power stations to turn off their power. If um, supply is getting higher than demand, they will be doing the opposite. And they, they also use great big batteries for regulating frequency, um, but I will not go into that level of detail. But the important thing about uh, to, to remember about how the current system uh, stability is maintained is that it's top down. We we guarantee the stability by by injecting power at the top and making sure that uh, supply and demand um, are balanced all the time. Now. If we, if we move now on to how we actually use energy, and, and we are talking about people, how we people use energy and how we make use of our energy infrastructure, what we notice is that uh, this chart is a representation of a typical uh, domestic energy user. And, um, I think we don't need to go too much into the detail of um, what the energy is being used for at the moment, but I think it's um, more representative is the shape of this chart. Um, because of the way we live our lives, because of the way um, our working patterns um, are, because of the, the way society as a whole uh, functions, we um, we have these peaks of demand for energy um, that uh, will happen between 5 and 9 p.m. This is mostly for, for domestic uh, energy users. For um, uh, non-domestic users, uh, the peak starts a bit earlier and finishes a bit earlier, but it's not that dissimilar. Now, one thing to bear in mind in looking at this is that um, if we have that maximum demand of energy and if we add up all the households and businesses in the country, the shape of that chart will remain the same. Uh, just the, the units will have grown by uh, factors of 10 to the power of 9. Um, the way the system our infrastructure has to be designed is to make sure that it can cope with that maximum demand. And uh, adding on top of that, some um, safety margin. Now, 
when we talk about maximum or being designed to cope with the maximum demand, uh, we have to bear in mind that that maximum demand uh, varies a lot during the year. So the, the actual peak demand might happen uh, in a cold day in the winter. Um, so the, the, the network has to be designed to cope with that. And, and that design capacity um, might actually only be needed to meet the demand requirement for a few hours in a whole year. Um, so that's the first thing that uh, I think it's, a, it's an important design criteria that we need to understand. The second one is when we look at this chart uh, and we have this whole network being designed to cope with that peak, if we look around that peak where there are lots of um, blank or white areas, uh, one way to interpret that is that uh, anything outside the peak, it's where the network or when the network infrastructure is not being utilized, it's sitting mostly idle. Uh, now, this, this chart shows our current um, energy use profile. With the aims of, reach, of uh, reaching zero carbon, we know that we'll need to electrify quite a lot of things. I think EV charging or transport in gen general, but if we are talking about um, citizens, um, people like us, uh, EV charging or electric vehicles will, will become a very big part of it. Uh, electrification of heat as well will become an important part of it. And um, what we might see is that um, the shape of that chart will change by, it is likely distorted, this one on the right, and uh, the big bit that was added on top shows the impact of electric vehicles in terms of the demand for electricity. Uh, and that is on top of the existing peak that we currently have. So as we add more and more electricity vehicles and we come home and we arrive home at the same time and we put our cars to charge, we are making, um, making it even worse the case for uh, straining the existing infrastructure. So if we just currently, if we just adopt EV without making any changes, uh, we would end up having to spend a lot of money putting more cables on the ground, putting more transformers and, and substations to be able to cope with that demand. Um, so doing something, something much more um, optimizing how we use the network becomes even more critical. Now, if you remember, I mentioned that uh, currently the system stability and the matching of supply and demand is done top down and it is coordinated by the national grid. So the national grid might be watching that and seeing that um, all the electric vehicles um, are coming online and they are starting to charge, demand is increasing, so they need to bring more supply in line. And we have these great big power plants and wind farms um, supplying more energy at the transmission network level, um, which is, yeah, it's trying to do its job. Now, what it's not dealing with is with the bottleneck. Um, EVs will be charging not on the transmission network. EVs will not be charging directly connected to primary substations. EVs will be charging uh, along our streets. For those that have off-street parking, uh, those cars will be charging their drives 
uh, people with hedge funds, they are connected to the low voltage network. Then suddenly what you have is a major bottleneck right at the edge of the network where our existing transformers are not coping with that extra demand. Um, even though we might have uh, plenty of power or, or generation capacity at the transmission level, getting that energy where it's needed uh, will present some major challenges. Um, so what is it that we are trying to do in optimizing these systems and making it um, in such a way that um, minimizing, minimizes that need for investing capital in more cables, wires, transformers, so we can make the most of our existing infrastructure. Um, the most obvious one that we have come up with is um, what we refer to as load shifting. Or if we try to, to um, diminish the size of that peak demand in the network by displacing it throughout the day. Um, and then we, we flatten that, um, that demand curve and we make better use of the network as it is. And we open up room for the new um, electricity demand that we will require. So kind of bringing it into very practical terms, um, we started with some simulations uh, to see what we could do by combining one of um, the PV installations that we have at a school, uh, as it happens in Rose Hill in Oxford, with a battery. And what I'm showing here is a simulated profile that we did to start with, where um, during the day when we would be simply exporting power back into the, um, into the grid, we are charging the, net, the batteries inside the school and uh, we discharge the battery right at the time when over the whole system we are facing that peak demand for electricity. Uh, and what we do with that is that we flatten the demand curve for, for the school. Now, it might not sound like much because it's only one tiny little school in Knoxford. So what is the impact that it will have on the overall system? Um, so what we can see is that the red line in this chart shows what the um, demand profile for the school is. Uh, being a school, it's mostly um, during the day. Um, and uh, although it wouldn't be contributing that much to the evening peak uh, of demand, uh, it does add up. Um, so what we are doing with the battery at Rose Hill is that we charge it up and then from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. we discharge the battery. So pretty much trying to eliminate uh, the demand for energy from the grid uh, during those peak periods. And uh, those vertical bars, what they are showing um, is the number of days in the year where we totally, when we totally eliminate the need for electricity from the grid for the school. Uh, and the blue line shows the rectified uh, demand from the grid uh, compared to how it was before um, the, the solar panels and the battery uh, were installed. And then you can see that the, the blue curve is much flatter than the red one, therefore making much better use of the existing infrastructure. Now, if we superimpose that onto the, the combined demand profiles, and if we start adding up from the edge of the grid, from, 
from individual households, SMEs, uh, schools, businesses, uh, and coordinating that approach or flattening that curve, we can collectively reduce the demand on the grid for those peak times. And again, making much better use of um, existing infrastructure and freeing up room for the new uh, demands that we, we have, particularly for uh, the electrification of transport and heat. Um, so this is about flexible power. It's flexibility when we use power and how we use power. So some examples of that, we could say, um, so when local network supply is tight, we can reduce our demand or we can shift it in time. Uh, we refer to that as smart demand or demand response. Um, if um, supply, uh, if demand is greater than supply, maybe we can increase local generation um, to meet that local demand. And, and the, the more balanced it is locally, the better for the overall system. Um, we also have peaks of generation. Imagine a um, sunny August Sunday when there is not much, you know, much going on, we might have too much generation going on, which the system can't cope with. And then we need to do something with it rather than just switching it off. Um, and also we can be making room for the new demand, um, as I mentioned before. Um, there are other clever ways that uh, we can be flexible in the way we use our infrastructure and the way we use energy. So there is something that uh, we've been trialing, which is um, working out how we can uh, share um, supply capacity or the capacity that we have to draw energy down from the grid. So if I'm an SME or a factory and I'm not using as much energy that uh, I'm allowed to use, and my neighbor needs to use a bit more than they are allowed to use, maybe we can share that rather than just hoarding capacity. This could be applied to the same. If I have a solar farm and um, I'm not generating as much as I can, maybe I can release that capacity to another solar farm in the same part of the network, again, to make better use of the existing infrastructure. And there is something else which uh, is very exciting, is how you can do real-time matching of demand and generation. So we can, um, if again, if, I, if my solar installation um, has reached its maximum contracted supply capacity, uh, but my neighbor can increase their demand, then I can exceed my generation, and we do that in real time. It's also referred to sometimes as offsetting. Um, within Project LEO, which is local energy Oxfordshire, for those that uh, have not heard about it before, it's a um, big innovation project that has been run uh, in Oxfordshire with a a uh, great big consortium of partners. Um, it is a one of uh, three uh, national um, major innovation projects funded through uh, central government. And uh, what we are trying to do is to demonstrate what a um, smart local energy system would look like. And within Project LEO, we, we are running these flexibility trials, they have some fancy names. Um, and uh, they are particularly targeted at um, dealing with network constraints uh, at those peak times um, when uh, our demand of energy puts quite a lot of strain in the network. So how can we help the network manage those times? It might be uh, by 
discharging a battery. It might be by delaying some use of energy. We have another another type of flexibility trial, which is which is about constraint management. Uh, again, another technical term, but it's to do with scheduled maintenance, fault and fault recovery. Um, this other one, I love it. It's called MIC-MAC trading. So uh, MIC stands for maximum import capacity. Uh, MAC is maximum export capacity. And it is how uh, different parties can be trading the contracted capacity they have in the network so they can do, be doing that sort of sharing I described before. Uh, I can borrow my neighbor's import capacity if I need to use more than I'm allowed. I can lend my export capacity to my neighbor if I'm not generating as much as I can. And then there is the offset, which is the real-time match uh, of demand and generation. And I put a reminder here, it's more for me than for, me, for anybody else. Uh, when we are talking about um, dealing with the flexibility trials, particularly with peak management, we need to remember that peaks don't um, only happen in times of high demand. We can also have uh, peaks of generation when, uh, particularly with um, renewables, we might have much more um, power being injected into the grid than there is demand. And therefore, it, it causes a problem and, and we need to deal with it. Um, so, what the, why does it matter? Um, I mentioned some technical stuff, which is about uh, where the bottlenecks um, really start to appear, particularly driven by um, EV charging and uh, heat pumps. It's going to happen right at the edge of the network, right at the LV, the low voltage part of the network, where the vast majority of of energy use takes place. Um, and by starting to um, optimize the grid from the very edge where energy is actually used, it makes, makes it for um, a better outcome. Uh, so we can optimize the use of the network and avoid those bottlenecks uh, to start with. But we also have the, the chance to involve people. Again, I mentioned at the very beginning, um, meters don't use energy. People use energy to meet their needs. So therefore, we need to make sure that whatever happens in the way we transform our energy system, that it is about people and how we use energy and what we use energy for. Um, so it is this contextual uh, stuff that, that are really important. Uh, but also that we don't leave people behind. Uh, there is a risk that uh, we, we start developing a system where we middle class people, great, we have our EV charging points that uh, we want to, to use whenever we want. We have our heat pumps and we have uh, these flexible assets that can switch on, switch off, um, delay, or and then make, make use of um, different time of day electricity prices. What about those people that don't have it, that they don't have the chance to have all these? Um, the way the system works is that our infrastructure costs if anything else, our infrastructure costs are socialized. We are all sharing the cost of this infrastructure collectively. Now, if there are a few people that benefit directly from smartening up our, our energy system and, um, and making it zero carbon, what we want to make sure doesn't happen is that those that can't afford are left picking up the bill. And the way to do so, we strongly believe, is by doing it from the bottom up, is 
by managing that optimization through a collective, um, as a collective result at, from the very local level and taking into account who the people are, how they use energy, what their energy use up for, and again, ensuring that those that are uh, most, that are most, that have least to benefit in terms of participating uh, in these smart network are not left to pick up the bill. That's it for me. So I will leave you to ask questions. Adriano, we've been having a, a, a really rattling time in the chat channel, and my my fingers have been going nineteen to the dozen trying to <laughs> trying to answer the questions. Um, you might have a different view on some of the answers I've given, so um, um, we could have a look at some of those. But we've um, th there's a lot about how the slide you showed. Um, showing a real sort of peak in the peak because of um, EV um, penetration into the market. There's been a lot of chat about how realistic that peak is, given that people um, are already um, programming their EVs to charge overnight. Um, some already seem to, or one or two already seem to be heavily into vehicle to grid. Um, and so and I've been pointing out some of the issues if everybody does have EVs and charge them overnight, the grid will no longer want to give people economy seven tariffs because there won't be any need for them and the knock on effect on poorer people potentially. Yes, I, I think that um, um, that curve uh, with the, the added demand in that in in the particular period when people get home uh, might be exaggerated um, and um, people might naturally um, move towards uh, charging their vehicles overnight uh, but we can't take it for granted i think that's the fir first point i would like to make it's early days, early adopters have a different approach to things compared to when it becomes mass market. Um, the second point I would make is that uh, even if we all adopted these um, smarter ways of programming when our cars are charged, if, if it is not done in a coordinated way, we are just going to just disp displace the problem. Um, so that's why I think it's about coordination. It's not all about looking at the individual household or, or at the, the individual business. Although it is very important that uh, that we we deal with it from that very small, uh, so we can add up to to a better outcome. But it has to be the uh, this coordinated approach. And that's why I, I kept referring to that the, the more local this coordination can take place, the better the outcome will be. Uh, a lot of, um, th there's also a lot of um, chat in, uh, in the channel, Adriano, about um, where people are talking about having PVs and a battery and EV and how um, how you might combine all of those so that you're self-consuming as much as possible in your own household. Um, what do you think the advantages, disadvantages, issues arising from that um, approach might be? Well, I, I think, first of all, um, energy um, the closer generation is to demand, the better. Uh, the, the more balanced we can make it, and starting from home, from our neighborhood, um, 
etc., the better, because we are the we are using less of that overall infrastructure. Um, in terms of um, combining the use of PV batteries uh, and smart control systems, um, I think it's fantastic. And I think it's fantastic to see that people are already doing it. Um, and, and I think the next layer is to do that in a much more coordinated way. Um, but I also, again, I, I keep referring back to this. Um, you know, if I can afford a heat pump and solar panels and uh, an EV, and I can benefit from all of that, uh, what about my neighbor that doesn't? Um, how do we make sure that um, uh, I'm picking up the benefits of having all that at hand while my neighbor is picking up all those socialized costs. So by all means, if um, for all of us, if we can, the more we match uh, supply and demand at home, the more we can flatten that curve, the better it is. Uh, the more we coordinate within our local areas, the better. So we ensure that uh, collectively we are optimizing how we use the system and so on. Um, we also have um, a question from Jeremy um, asking if we could give him a glimpse of how local coordination might work in practice. What sort of devices or networking is needed? And I know that that is precisely up your street. <laughs> Right, okay, so, um, oh no, I, I might lose people now. Uh, it's not only me, a lot of people think about a fractal network with um, where every node of the network um, is very similar in the way it is designed, follow some very, very simple and common rules. So a node in the network um, could be my house. Uh, a node in, an, in the network could be the transformer along my street. And that is the combination of all the little nodes that uh, are connected to that transformer. Um, and um, each node will have uh, its own little brain. And what this little brain is trying to do is to coordinate inside itself how to optimize um, uh, how it is using and displacing use and uh, making the best of local generation and so on. But there would also be the big brain, which is in the cloud, which is providing the sort of, the, the sort of coordination coming from uh, taking input from the, low, the, the nodes that are um, below. So it takes the information from, from the household. It looks at the, the overall pattern and might start sending signals back so th that each node can start readjusting itself. Now, these sorts of things, and it might scare people, um, will be very difficult to, to make it work if it's done manually, if not impossible. So the way I see it working in the future um, and for it to work is that it will be reliant on a lot of um, automated processes that will be analyzing that data that is coming from EV charging, that is coming from um, heat pumps that is coming from the overall demand of energy at each node that will com be combining that with um, weather forecasting um, and, um, and signaling back um, optimum um, outcome to be reached. I don't know how kind of if I muddied the water or otherwise. Oh, great. 
Uh, we've got a few more questions that are in the chat, Adriana. One's from Gavin, which says, peak avoidance is the immediate opportunity, but when do you think the more exciting opportunity of real-time offsetting will start to come to the fore? Um, so real-time offsetting um, is technically difficult, but there are demonstrators. Um, it will require a lot of coordination. But I think uh, probably the biggest challenge for that is the lack of a digital infrastructure, uh, which is an essential part of a smart energy system, particularly a smart local energy system. Uh, but there, is, there are also um, regulatory barriers because the, the real value from that would come from um, local energy trading or sometimes referred to as peer-to-peer -peer trading where that um, matching of local generation and local demand is captured at the very same uh, network hierarchical level as it's taking place. At the moment, it doesn't make any difference you're, if you're buying energy that is generated um, by a coal power station in goodness knows where, or a massive wind farm in the North Sea, or solar panels um, sitting at your neighbor's house. Uh, once, we, once there is kind of real value apportioned for local, energy in such a way that um, the more local, the more valuable, I think that we will unlock the true potential. That's excellent. And um, we've also had, we had another question early on from Nolene about Project Leo saying, do you have any results from Project Leo yet or are we still in the planning stage? Um, so we've been uh, carrying out a lot of um, uh, trials. So the, the end, one of the end goals of um, the trials in Project Leo is in managing this, um, the, managing the network with these flexibility trials is to have a fully automated process where the network operator detects times when um, the network is under strain and automatically they call for these flexibility services to alleviate the problem. Um, so at the moment, we are at a point where I'm gonna brag a little bit. Um, the, the network operator can send us the low carbon hub a signal, which is a SMS message or an email um, asking us to discharge a battery or to reduce the power output of Sunford Hydro, for example, and we remotely and automatically can do that. Um, if um, SSCN, the network operator, asks us to schedule a battery discharge at uh, Rosehill Primary School uh, next month, um, on the, I don't know, the 15th of March between 5 and 6 p.m. We can schedule it today and automatically on the 15th of March at five o'clock, that battery will be turned on. So th there are tangible outcomes and that we are seeing already. I think Adriano, have you mentioned that we have actually used the river as a battery? Oh, that's another exciting one. Um, so uh, I, that's a, a good point, Barbara, that uh, kind of when we, when we think about storage, uh, the, the immediate thing that comes to mind is a battery. Um, but there are many other forms of storage. We can store energy in the form of hot water. We can preheat our water, uh, hot water tank. Uh, we can store energy even by cooling down buildings and therefore not needing the air conditioning later on. Um, and the other thing that we've been doing as part of LEO is 
we can slow down the turbines in the hydro, we allow the breather level to increase slightly and within very safe limits. And then when it comes to 5 p.m., when that peak time starts hitting, we increase the, the speed of the screws and they start discharging more power by releasing that water that we held upstream. And I think one thing that we haven't discussed very much yet is, um, is capacity trading. Um, and one of the things that we have at Sanford is um, um, a machine or a set of machines that can generate about 40 kilowatts more than uh, the grid connection we were able to get from SSEN. And so um, finding a partner who can work with us so that we can generate more than our current grid connection export capacity um, could be good for them and, and good for and good for us. So th there's that sort of trading room in the wires and switches, um, as well as trading um, energy yes. room. And and it is a, a, again, it's about it's a good example of how we can optimize the network because uh, at the moment it's very rigid. Uh, Sunford Hydro has a maximum export capacity that uh, we can't generate more than that. Uh, there might be a solar, a few solar installations in the industrial state that uh, are restricted in the amount of uh, the amount of generation because they could be exporting on a Sunday. Uh, however, how likely is it that the hydro is going to be at full power? Uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, or those solar panels will be exporting in the middle of the winter. So again, if if we can coordinate that, we um, by kind of smartly looking at these things, uh, working in real time, we can make much better use of our existing infrastructure and release room for these new things that are coming without having to uh, waste the money on bigger wires and switches on the grid, but put them into the assets that actually help us to run our lives instead. I think one of the other things that we haven't really touched on yet is um, all of the work that we've been doing around Ray Valley Solar, which is um, our, what our current raise is, is for. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's invested. It's been an absolutely glorious ride so far. Um, uh, in that with Ray Valley Solar, we've invested in um, uh, smart inverters. I understand, Adriana, you'll be able to tell people in a lot more detail what we've done so that we've um, we've given ourselves the opportunity of over generating according to our export capacity by about 1.1 megawatts. Um, and so, again, looking for the partner that we can trade export capacity with so that we can generate more from our solar and give an upside on our financial model is something that we're uh, looking at and in order and part of what we're doing is making sure also that the contracts that we have the long-term power purchase contracts are flex ready as much as the machine the you know the, the kit itself is flex ready i think that's right uh yes so uh, it is um yet again another interesting case study because um, the great majority of solar farms that are built, um, because they are built for the way things work now and, um, and they work within these very rigid rules, um, they are designed in such a way that um, they are actually clipping or reducing the maximum output capacity in the summer uh, compared to, to the um, contracted export capacity. And the equipment that is being put in um, won't allow them to, to be controlled. So what we found out as we are developing Ray Valley Solar is that um, with a kind of materially kind of small incremental cost, 
we can make the solar farm ready to be flexible. Uh, and, and that marginal cost is insignificant compared to the total cost of the solar farm. Now, if we didn't do it now and we waited um, for when the, the market rules are better defined, retrofitting or um, refitting these into an existing uh, asset or solar farm would be significantly more expensive. Um, so it's a kind of a, it benefits the low carbon hub um, and its members uh, on one hand because it's driving innovation and showing, demonstrating how innovation can take place, but also by um, making the, the power plant flexible with these minimum uh, upfront investment. So not only we would, we would be able to, um, to flex that generation uh, capacity when we are allowed to, but we could also be trading that with neighboring solar farms or doing that sort of offsetting with um, a factory, for example, which is in the same area of the network. Um, and we had a question uh, which I've answered about uh, DC, but um, uh, Nicholas asks whether um, uh, is whether there's room to explore DC at the house level to better enable storage and charging solutions. And I said, yeah, absolutely, especially since most of the kit that we're actually using at the moment um, runs on DC. Uh, so um, have you got any views on DC houses, Adriano? Um it would make life easier. <laughs> it would waste, waste a little less energy. <laughs> yeah. No, well, um, it is, um, it, it would certainly make life easier. Uh, but there might be some um, safety uh, reasons why um, it hasn't been done so to start with. Um, I think there will be a hierarchy of um, kind of benefits um, where you have some pretty big improvements to be gained uh, and then they will diminish uh, as, as we keep deploying them. Um, I think the biggest benefit uh, probably will come from being able to have these um, digital infrastructure in place so we can start to connect these nodes of the network in smart ways and we can start putting in place these really clever coordination um, algorithms uh, and working with people so the signals that are going into the, these coordination algorithms are not only about volts and, and pounds but other important metrics and signals uh, that come from individuals and from, from communities. So I think that would be the, the biggest gain. Um, unfortunately, smart meters are not exactly part of that digital infrastructure. Um, but don't let me get started on that. Yeah, I think we probably shouldn't. <laughs> I, think that, I think that little... Um, discussion and um, well of bitterness could go on all night um, and I think we should make you know for those who are not quite um, uh, up to speed with uh, with that little in joke between me and Adriano at the moment um, you may all have been hearing about the smart meter rollout and if it's a SMET2 meter then probably you know it is a good thing to do it's going to be helpful to this transformation but um, the whole way that we manage meter installation, meter in ownership and data ownership from those meters in this country is an absolute dog's dinner and needs to be sorted out if we're going to make this transition. We would say, wouldn't we, Adriano? Yeah, yeah. no, I think, uh, I think that um, uh, smart meters have an important role to play. Uh, you know, they, they could have been designed slightly different and adding a pound to their cost. 
but maybe they will be improved in the future. Um, they are good things, um, but I think we need much more. It's like, uh, you know, the, the power of the internet, uh, if I draw an analogy, um, try to imagine running the internet with fax machines. It wouldn't work. Trying to unleash the, the power of the internet using those uh, dial-up modems this is likely better, but it's not quite the full thing. Um, so I, I'm drawing a parallel that uh, the, the, the kind of the magnitude of transformation that uh, we need and that we're kind of trying to develop is the equivalent uh, from using kind of just normal telephone to being able to have a webinar where everybody is present and uh, we are talking to each other, or at least you are listening to me <laughs> and seeing my face. Uh, that, that is the, the magnitude of transformation that we hope to achieve in the medium term. And that's the way to a zero carbon uh, energy system. I think that's probably um, a really good place to... I was going to say, I think that's, that's an excellent bit to end on really um and i just like to say we are i'm conscious of time we have overrun a bit so i'd just like to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us and thank you so much to adriano and barbara for your time this evening it's been really interesting discussion and very exciting lots of really exciting stuff going on um, that we can look forward to in the future and if you do have any questions that we haven't been able to get to please do send them in into info at lowcarbonhub.org and we'll um, do our best to get back to you with some answers there. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely rest of your evening.